it's really fantastic to be here another year with another um, community meeting. Um, I do apologize. I actually am in transit. So if there is a little bit of background noise, um, please bear with me. I won't be speaking the entire time, but hopefully technology is my friend today and uh, mutes or, or uh, suppresses the background noise. Um, I started the session or the, or the meeting earlier today in, in an earlier session, just thanking everyone and just sharing that how immensely proud I am and how immensely proud the team are to be part of this global community. And really just um, starting with the, the, the note that our success as data site is really in the collective, collective contributions to the different working groups, steering groups, expert groups, but as well as the collective investments in, in sustaining the infrastructure, but also building technology and services in your communities advocating for the work that we do to make sure that research information, research outputs, research resources are broadly available and disseminated for the better of society globally. And so it's really exciting to be part of that community, to be part of that community and working with you all. In the session uh, now, we're going to talk a bit about some of the strategic insights. I'll share a bit uh, about our insights and outlook and some reflections, as well as Britta sharing and some details around our operations and finance and strategic trajectory around these. Um, Helena will share a bit more around our community engagement insights, and then Sarala will share um, some details around our engineering aspects, and we'll, we'll end with a brief Q&A. Um, I also wanted to call out uh, two other sessions where you'll hear from data site directors following this session and um, directly after this session. We'll, we'll discuss our roadmap, and that's going to be led by Maria, our product director. And later today, there will be a session around Make Data Count, one of the strategic initiatives we we involved in, and that will be led by Aracha, the Make Data Count director. So with that, I will jump right into um, the initial kind of more broad insights and outlook um, from data sites. And I always like to check back in on our multi-year strategic plan. For those that you... For those of you that were around at the time, um, we established this plan through a robust process working with the community in consultation and developing a strategic plan that led to um, a plan that was implemented from 2022 through to 2025. Um, and so naturally, during the course of next year, we'll also be engaging with you all to build the next iteration of that multi-year plan. But unfortunately, that plan helps us as the data site staff and also with the board and the various working groups and regional expert groups and also direct member consultations. We also are able to further our roadmap and also develop the annual plans and, and uh, effectively the objectives for each year. And so um, looking more broadly, um, just to recap, the, the three pillars in that plan are one, pillar one, developing trusted community services, and this is around fostering, you know, really this engagement with the community and bringing that into building scalable, stable services. The second pillar is around focusing on bringing enriched metadata and connections between different aspects of the research life cycle, so the different outputs and resources, so that we can bring more rigor to the scholarly records. And then the final pillar was around supporting all outputs and resources. And so this includes uh, diversifying the different outputs and resources that we provide as, as part of our controlled uh, resource types in our schema, um, but also looking at partnerships with established communities in certain areas, uh, such as the partnership with IDSN and RAID. And you'll hear a bit, bit about that um, in different, different sessions today, as well as this session. We focus on this collective success quite a lot. And, and so um, it goes without saying that um, we we obviously rely so heavily on this because our technology is not necessarily, we don't do anything novel in the sense of, of technology. Obviously, we, we innovate and, and we, we uh, hold that as, as a key priority to, to innovate, but it's really the social technical partnership that brings that innovation and that brings meaning to the work that we do. And so working together, we improve, and this works across the 3,500 repositories, databases, catalogs, and more that are integrated into the system. 
or in, in, into the ecosystem rather. Uh, we also collaborate with the broader community and various initiatives. And so some examples of that is the Make Data Count initiative, which is around developing responsible, meaningful data metrics and the raw registry, the research organization registry, where we support a unique identification of research organizations. There's a really exciting moment for change in the community. And so you'll hear me talk in a moment a bit about some of the key aspects for, for uh, the, the upcoming years and, and uh, more relevant specifically next year. But one of the core things that we do is focus on metadata. It's not just around the persistent identifier, not just around the DOI, but it's the DOI metadata that brings context and brings meaning to the work that we do. And what we've seen over the course of this year and over the last two years more, more, more broadly, I think, is that there's more appetite for change and a uh, recognition for interconnection across the research landscape. Um, this obviously involves leveraging standards. It involves working with the community and working together with you in bringing our diverse perspectives across the globe and bring this more balanced metadata flow to ensure that we can provide a rich contextual source of information for the research activities, the research outputs and resources and the contributions to those to the global community to enable better discovery and advancement of knowledge across the globe. And so um, we will, you'll see us starting to talk a lot more around um, flows of metadata between different systems and some ideas around this that we need to work through with you as a community and specifically building in core things such as provenance tracking, where metadata is coming from, the different connections, um, as well as functionality to ensure that we can expose metadata um, with that transparency and with that track that the community needs. Um, one example um, of this typical flow or a vision for a multi-dimensional uh, flow is that we can have um, all of the data site members obviously registering, persistent identifiers registering DOIs with metadata this metadata is harvested by various third parties such as Open Alex, also here, Gophers, Dimensions, etc. Um, but we also then have this harvested into other sources and other repositories. And specifically, if we think about not just broad harvesting on the entire DOI metadata record, it could be certain elements such as a relational link, so a citation or a link to a branch or a project. Um, and these sources obviously feed back into some of these aggregators as well, and they can feed that back into our store and make those links available and other metadata properties, as well as working with the broader community um, in helping us enrich and bring this metadata together to ensure that we're delivering value to you as members to provide and, and keep up to date rich contextual metadata about these outputs and resources. And so this is something that's um, th there's a lot of appetite for change around and something that you'll see us talking a lot more around over the coming year and certainly leading into the next iteration of the multi-year strategic plan. We want to validate some of these concepts and make sure that there's support for some of the different aspects that we're working on here um, with the community. And so looking ahead, uh, really the focus is around metadata. So making sure that we uh, have good structured um, completeness of, of metadata properties, as well as enhancing the schema. Um, the quality and the provenance needs to be there so that we can track how metadata is kept up to date. And we also need to ensure that we expand our services and refine our services to these evolving needs of the community. Um, all this being said, as a community organization, as a global community, everything that we do remains grounded and data science was founded in 2009 by the research community for the research community and so that remains true today is that everything that we do the direction the decisions are driven by the community and working hand in hand to make these decisions together and refine our ecosystem it's an iterative approach so we don't look to make uh, disappear and come back in a year's time and say, hey, this is something that we've been working on. Is this something that's valuable to the community? We really want to work on iterative 
um, improvements and adapt based on feedback and, and evolving demands of the community and keeping that aligned with delivering tangible benefits and solutions uh, for the researchers and institutions, research institutions worldwide. With that, I will hand over to Britta and she will share a bit about some of the operational and financial strategic aspects. Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, I'm Britta Dreyer. I'm Data Sites uh, Operations and Finance Director, and I will hopefully give you an uh, interesting insight into our finances, uh, the membership, and our global team, all from a, yeah, a sustainability perspective. So to start with our my first slide here, um, so to effectively drive strategic direction, just explained and described by Matt, an organization needs a strong financial and operational foundation. Uh, the pie chart uh, on your left shows data sites for different revenue streams, the membership fees, service fees, so the DOI service fees, project funding, and donations. So the stable revenue from membership and service fees is essential to fund scalable infrastructure and highly skilled personnel for handling growth, efficiency, innovation, and support of our membership and the community. Um, this revenue type ensures current and long-term sustainability of data site. The more dynamic and time-limited project funding is also very important, and it's used for community-driven innovation and collaboration. You know, Matt just mentioned, you know, the metadata um, enrichment initiatives that also would be one example of that community-driven innovation. Um, so, and at the end of last year, we introduced our brand new fourth revenue stream donations as a charitable association. We can, um, you know, accept donations, um, and these donations are directly contributing to the Global Access Fund, enabling participation for less represented regions. I will talk a little bit more about this later. Um, so, and the the line chart basically shows you the five year trajectory of these uh, income types, and you see that. Um, there's a steep increase in service fee revenue in the last five years. And the reason for this are twofold. So firstly, an increase in DOI registrations across the community, particularly as Matt has mentioned, the IGSN community joining data site. Um, and secondly, the introduction of the consortium model in 2020, which enabled year to date uh, 1,210 research organizations to join one of the 63 global consortia, and you know they generally pay service fees exclusively, at least to data site. Um, and you can also see that project funding fluctuates as projected. Um, so there there will be peaks and and dips that don't affect our you know, sustainability. Um, but these are important for innovations, as I mentioned earlier. So, and we are continuing our efforts uh, to generate donations. Next slide, please. So here you see um, the development of the different member types uh, and the consortium organizations. Uh, on a five-year trajectory. And you see also the distribution, uh, the green, these are the consortium organizations. They grow rapidly in number, as I mentioned. Um, and then you also see the blue, these are the direct members, which grow slowly. We currently have 249 direct members. The yellow are the consortia, 63, growing slowly. Um, particularly in the uh, less represented regions in, in uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. 
there we see new consortia starting and we have uh, eight supporting members. These supporting members support data sites mission. Um, so we, yeah, that's something else I'll just, uh, yeah, introduce and mention or explain a little bit more later. So, and on the right side, you can see uh, the impact of the consortium model on nine most representative countries. Um, these, these are chosen by the number of participating organizations within these countries and by the volume of their member fees, including both membership fees and service fees. And you see in the US, we have a comparably high number of, uh, of members, so 144. These are direct members and consortium members. And we have 87 consortium organizations. Whereas in Germany, you see a very much inverted ratio where we have only 25 members, you know, again, including consortium members and 241 consortium organizations. And as you go down the line, uh, you see that this inverted ratio continues across the other seven most represented countries. So as a membership organization, we understand the importance of community and the value of direct collaboration. That's why we introduced, and now we, I've come back to the supporting member program. So we are reintroducing or basically launching a supporting member program designed for consortium organizations that want to support data site directly while still benefiting from the guidance and services of their local consortium lead. That's one leg. And the other strong leg is it welcomes participation from the broader community, enabling everyone to contribute to and to strengthen our shared mission. Next slide, please. So about 10 years after we were founded, uh, in the third quarter of 2020, DataSite reached economies of scale, where the non-project expenditures, the green line, are less than income from member fees, including you know, membership fees and the DOI service fees components. Um, this is achieved by multiple efforts, uh, including the, the continuous membership growth and you know, the consortium organization growth, obviously as well, very much so, and uh, the increase in DOI registrations. Both of these effects are on the income side. And on the expenses side, it's due to dedicated cost management via budgets and saving plans, as well as process optimization. And the optimization efforts include the integration of several systems, for example, Fabrica and our CRM system to streamline membership support, adoption, application, as well as billing and uh, accounting processes. Very recently, we have implemented an automated process process to efficiently and transparently manage the global access fund. The, the achieved surplus, so the gap that you see between the green and the blue line starting in, the, in 2020 uh, is essential. That surplus is essential for organizational long-term sustainability uh, and participating in participation in community-driven developments and also in the you know, strategic partnerships we have. Next slide, please. Um, so we are a global team and uh, we have a very diversified team in terms of countries and languages. And here you see the positive correlation between local team support and the expansion of member countries. The green line representing the countries our team members uh, are based in and the orange line, the growing um, member country number. 
we understand that membership participation and expansion rely on the strengths of a global team. And um, they are key factors in advancing our community-driven objectives. So in 2023 and 2024, we were able to expand to nine new member countries. And you can, next slide, please. Uh, and that's my last slide. Here you can clearly see um, in, in green um, how we have expanded from 2019 to 2024, unfortunately, only in different shades of green. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a template that didn't let me change the colors. But you can also see circled in red the new regions. And um, that is due to our 27 members in 14 countries speaking 20 languages that have collaboratively expanded the community in Latin America, particularly Africa and Asia. And that was made possible by the ZZI funding for the Global Access Program. Um, and in order to stabilize, uh, support and sustain these efforts, we are now launching the, the Global, or we have launched and um, want, to, want to strengthen the Global Access Fund donation campaign. So if you do have, you know have, um, budget left for this year in your organization, please, please contact us. We'll be um, happy to uh, take donations for that important effort. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to close with these words and, uh, and give up to Helena. Yeah, thank you, Britta. And maybe you or Paul can also share the link to the call for support in the chat so that interested people can take a look. Um, then I'll go ahead and share my screen. There we go. I hope that all looks okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for all being here today. I'm really happy that, uh, yeah, we're having another community meeting today and to see so many of you attending different sessions and engaging with us. I'm Helena, I'm the Director of Community Engagement, and so I will share some insights around uh, our community engagement efforts. I first wanted to um, introduce the community engagement team. Um, basically, within that team, we have three different units. We have an adoption unit. The adoption unit um, works with our existing member community, they, for example, provide support, but also work on metadata and workflows. We have a membership unit, they work with the broader community, they work with potential members, new members, do onboardings. Um, and as Britta said, they are uh, based in different parts of the world to ensure that we uh, have a good understanding of what's relevant uh, across continents and can work with members globally. And then we have an outreach unit. Uh, they're responsible for communications, for events. For example, they um, were responsible for organizing the community meeting today. So I guess I'll also take this opportunity to thank them for doing such a great job uh, organizing all these sessions um, for our community today. Um, yeah, as both Matt and Britta said, I guess, obviously what we do, uh, the community is really key. Uh, our member community is a very important part of that, but we work with different kinds of stakeholders. For example, integrators are very important to us. We work with service providers that have an integration with the DataSide API to enable other organizations to register DOIs and metadata with us, uh, and also uh, harvesters that harvest DataSide metadata to make it available uh, across discovery systems, aggregation platforms, et cetera. Then obviously collaborators, those were mentioned as well, in some cases in projects or for strategic initiatives, uh, organizations that have similar goals that we then work towards together and policymakers um, that drive change through relevant uh, open science, open data policies. Then briefly about our member community, Britta also showed a lot of numbers um, just to mention, we have 321 members um, representing 1,457 organizations. I saw a question in the Q&A 
um, which I can maybe address while I'm talking about this, because I think someone was asking what's the difference between a consortium member and a consortium organization. Uh, when Britta talked about consortium members, she meant the, cons the consortia as a whole. So one consortium is one member, uh, but obviously in some cases representing many different organizations within that consortium. Uh, we work uh, globally across 56 countries and our members at this point have registered over 66 million DOIs. And you can see that growth uh, in DOI numbers on this slide. Um, DOI registration started um, in 2005 before DataSide was even founded in 2009. But you can see, especially the last couple of years, there has been um, a massive increase in the numbers of DOIs registered, bringing us um, to the 66 million DOIs I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, and that's um, both registered and findable DOIs for the people that are familiar with the, with the different DOI states. Um, and then as Matt said, obviously metadata is really the key thing. Um, and so also this year, our theme was driving quality metadata and reuse. So we really focus on looking at the metadata uh, that the members register with us. Within our metadata schema, we distinguish between mandatory elements, recommended elements and optional elements. Uh, obviously, Metadata completeness is very good for the mandatory elements because members are always asked to uh, register those. Um, but some of the recommended elements, you can also see that a lot of information is entered. And we're just trying to keep an eye on this to see how we can improve this and work with the members to ensure that um, they enter very rich metadata when they register DOIs with us. Then, uh, Another thing that I think provides a quite interesting insights into, um, into DOI registration practices is looking at resource types. So which types of outputs are DOIs being registered for? Uh, I hope it's not too small on my screen, um, but as you can see, data sets is still um, the largest here, but physical objects and text very closely follow data sets. So I think it's very clear from this uh, visual that we do not, our members do not only register DOIs for data sets, but really for a wide range of outputs. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see images, preprints, journal articles, collections. So there are many different outputs um, that DOIs are being registered for by the research organizations that work with us. I think what also provides some insight into what DOIs are being registered for is um, the information from the subject field. This is free text, so people can enter whatever is most relevant. That, that's also why there's so many different terms on my screen. Um, but yeah, it shows us that there are many different domains um, that register DOIs and metadata with us. Now, if we look at some of the highlights, um, across the different uh, areas that we're working on within the community engagement team. Um, I already on the previous slides showed some metadata insights sort of across all DOI registrations, but what we've been doing this year is doing more analytics and also metadata consultations for individual members to help members get more insight into uh, their own metadata registration practices. The photo you can see was at PitFest earlier this year in June in Prague, where we had a metadata health booth where members uh, could uh, come up to us for their own individual analyses. Um, and it's still possible to get an analysis from us if you're interested in uh, what your organization is currently doing. So if that's something you want to know more about, please uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can provide you with a report. And then again, on the, on the topic of driving quality metadata and reuse, there were quite a lot of uh, activities around the data site metadata schema. We announced that we'll be deprecating schema three because we want to ensure that all members are using the most up-to-date and relevant schema, schema four. We also introduced data site schema 4.5 earlier in the year, and we had two requests for uh, feedback, one in March and one that's actually open right now. So I think one of my colleagues will share a link in the chat. Uh, and yeah, we welcome community input to ensure that um, 
our metadata schema is relevant and useful to you. Then on the outreach side, obviously we have today's event, but we're also organizing several in-person events. Uh, those are called Datasite Connect. We had one earlier this year in Prague, co-located with PitFest, and we still have two coming up later in the year. Uh, one will be co-located with uh, ETD 2024 and will take place in Zambia and Africa. And the other one will be co-located with the RDA and will take place in Costa Rica. So if you're going to be attending one of these events, please do sign up and, uh, and join us there. It's always uh, really great to have a chance to interact with people in person. And also the outreach unit um, together with the membership unit launched an ambassadors program this year with ambassadors, I think from nine countries speaking seven languages to really, as Britta said, support that global outreach and engagement. They also worked on new outreach materials. For example, we have several new IGSN materials, uh, a flyer and a brochure. And we're also working on a new data site flyer and brochure. So we're expecting to make that available later this year. Then on the membership side, Britta already shared quite some numbers, but I wanted to highlight that we have four new consortia joining data site this year, including in some new countries such as Jordan and Zimbabwe and also a consortium specifically for RAID registration. We published landscape analyses uh, covering Asia and the MENA region um, to share insights into the repository and pit landscape in the regions. And uh, we'll be making these kinds of analyses available for Latin America and Africa as well later this year. And very important, we have a second call for proposals open right now for the Data Site Global Access Fund. So organizations from Africa or Asia or Mid Middle East or Latin America can apply for funding for infrastructure and outreach activities. So if you are an organization in one of these regions or you are in touch with an organization in one of these regions, please uh, do share the call for proposals. Uh, it's open until the 11th of October. And yeah, we're hoping uh, to receive some really good applications. We're very happy with the applications that came in last year and the projects that are currently ongoing. Uh, so yeah, we believe we'll uh, have another uh, good round this year. And then um, briefly on some of our partnerships, uh, Matt touched on some of those as well. Here, I just uh, wanted to highlight the partnerships we have currently where we're working with identifier communities. I think most of you will be familiar with our partnership with IGSN. Uh, which is already a bit more established and all data site members have the, the uh, possibility to register IGSNs through their own memberships using their own accounts and many already are. Uh, and much more recently, actually last week, um, RAID, the research activity identifier, established a data site consortium that can be used to uh, register RAIDs for projects. Um, here it's not the case that rates can be registered directly using your existing uh, member accounts. All rates will be registered through uh, the rate, rate consortium. So if that's something that's of interest to you, then please reach out to rate. I mean, they're very happy um, to work with you to ensure you can register rates for your projects. And then lastly, also DISCO is also a more recent partnership. They focus on uh, the registration of DOIs for specimen. Uh, uh, they got started now with uh, the registration of DOIs within the system and are in the process of scaling up. Um, so that's also something uh, that enables the community to again register DOIs for a wider range of research outputs. Um, again, we said we uh, really value all the community input. And I specifically wanted to call out that we have a lot of volunteers that contribute to data side um, by being part of a steering group or working group or expert group. Um, and that brings a lot of value to data side. I realize there's quite a lot on the slide, but we have two steering groups, a community engagement steering group and a services and technology steering group. And the community engagement steering group works with several regional expert groups, one for the EMEA region, one for the APEC region, and one for the Americas. 
and the services and technology steering group works with the metadata working group on our metadata schema. Uh, every year there's a call for nominations for new um, members to join these groups. So the, the next call for nominations will open in October. So if this is something that's of interest to you, then um, well, keep an eye out or contact us now. We're very happy to hear from you and have new uh, people join these groups. So that brings me to my last slide. Uh, I already mentioned when talking about DOI registration that DataSite was founded in 2009 which means that uh, DataSite turns 15 this year, and actually that happens on the 1st of December. So we'll be celebrating that the first week of December. We'll have a celebratory open hours on the 4th of December. Um, I think Paul will put a link in the chat. Um, please do join us for that so we can all look back at the, the past 15 years. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and with that, I think I'll hand over to Sorella. Uh, thank you. Let me just get myself settled in here. Okay. Can you all see my screen? We can indeed. Okay. Thank you, Rory. All right. So um, thanks, Helena. I am um, Sarala the engineering director at DataSide. Um, in the next few minutes, I will speak a bit about um, the engineering team and what we've achieved um, so far in the past year. And then I will um, talk a bit about what we will do in the next coming year. Uh, let me get to the next slide, yeah. Okay, so this is the engineering team. We are a diverse team located around the world. Um, we bring different expertise, um, experiences, and work very well together to maintain our existing services and also support the uh, evolving needs of the community. Um, in general, um, uh, each of the team members tend to uh, work on specific services, um, but we all spread across different services when we need to. Um, so as I go through the slides, uh, you will see um, which areas the individuals, the individual team members focus on at a sort of a high level. So as you all know, um, our core services falls into four major categories. The first one is um, the services around uh, creating DOIs. So we have many different APIs and also Fabrica, their uh, user interface for creating DOIs. And then um, we have services around discovery. Um, our main discovery interface is Dataside Commons. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of APIs that you can use to discover data side DOIs and also metadata associated with it. Um, um, we also have a lot of um, um, services that you can integrate with your own tools and platforms so you can create and update DOIs uh, very um, easily within your own sort of systems. Um, and last but not least, uh, we also um, develop a lot of services around um, reuse and tracking of these data site DOIs. So I will uh, go into a little bit of detail on each of these services. So um, to sort of uh, talk about what we've achieved um, in the last year or so. Um, as Matt and Helena both mentioned, um, um, in the past year, we worked a lot with different identifier communities um, to bring in this ident community identifiers, which are functionally DOIs. Um, so we, we worked with IGSN, RAID, and DISCOR. Um, so last year, we re-registered over 10 million uh, IGSN DOIs. So as you can see on the graph here, um, 
including uh, our normal DOI info as well as their IGSA re-registrations, re we added 20 million DOIs just last year. Um, so when I joined Datasight in 2019, we had less than 20 million DOIs. So that was a huge growth in one year. So we had to work a, a lot around improving workflows and providing more uh, resources um, to uh, deal with the, the size. And it went really well. So that was a real successful story to tell. Um, in addition, we also released uh, Metadata 4.5 earlier in the uh, earlier in the year, um, which supports uh, instruments, pre-registrations and registered reports. And we will work on the next sort of releases in the coming year um, as well. Um, in addition to uh, sort of a new work, we spent a lot of time in the last year really upgrading our underlying software, specifically Fabrica for the registration uh, to reduce technical debt and in turn improving security and also user experience. I'm hoping that you're already seeing some difference there. Um, uh, moving on to uh, discovery services. So our main discovery service, as I said, is data site commons. Um, we were part of two grant projects um, last year, uh, um, FAIR Island and FAIR um, Workflows. As part of those grants, we um, added visualizations to DMP and project pages. So as you can see, um, this shows the, the connections between different uh, connected uh, works uh, there. And then there's more graphs down here. And we also uh, added extra features to download metadata and also different filters. So you can uh, filter through different connection types, et cetera. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interesting graphs there now, uh, uh, which was funded by this project. Um, and we also spend a lot of time again uh, with Commons updating uh, software um, to reduce a uh, technical debt. Um, moving on to um, Harvester Service. So for many years, uh, the community has been interested in getting access to our metadata easily to do research or build services. So as part of another project called uh, Fair Call for EOSC, um, we uh, developed the Harvester Service um, um, so we released the first public data file, which consists of uh, all data site DUI metadata records uh, in the early part of this year. Um, and as part of the project, we also released uh, PID links, which are sort of the relationships between different PIDs that we have within, within our data site metadata. Uh, so that was uh, an exciting release. So it's a, this was our first release. So uh, we'd be really interested in hearing more about um, um, sort of what, what you find useful and what we should be doing uh, going forward to improve this service. Um, so uh, the next session, Maria is talking about our product roadmap. So do join there. And then she will also talk about how you can provide us feedback on these. Um, um, so when it comes to data matrix, there's a lot of interest, uh, interest in finding out how these DOIs are used, um, how many times these are viewed, download, etc. So we are part of uh, this initiative called Make Data Count Initiative, uh, where uh, there's a lot of work as a community uh, that um, everyone's working on in terms of uh, uh, um, getting data matrix out there for data. Uh, for data. So as part of MDC grant, uh, we have uh, worked um, for many years on this grant in different phases of this grant. Um, 
uh, so we developed a usage tracker. So we did a little bit of tweaking around on the usage tracker, uh, which is a service where you can add a sort of a, a widget you can add to your um, repository pages where we get the downloads and views. So you can view them through our data site commons um, application. Um, and we also release uh, the data citation corpus as a part of this uh, project uh, where um, the data includes um, data site uh, citations as well as um, um, accession number, uh, uh, sort of the, the papers to accession number uh, mentions uh, that were um, uh, picked up by an algorithm run by a CZI. So that was sort of an initial work there uh, to find out um, what we can get from these algorithms. Uh, so you can explore a bit of the data there. Um, the, the link is uh, um, um, at the bottom of the slides. And again, we uh, spent a lot of time, the team spent a lot of time improving their data site for code base to reduce technical debt. So this was really an important theme that we kind of followed the, throughout the year to reduce our technical debt. Um, moving on to infrastructure. Um, I think I'm still good with time. Okay, maybe slightly late, but okay. I'll, this is um, my last slide anyway. Um, with infrastructure, all our infrastructure runs in AWS, and we spend a lot of time this um, past year really upgrading those components to run on um, the newer um, sort of hardware instances and uh, use newer software. Um, this also in it improves their speed, performance, and also like security aspect of things. Um, and we also worked on sort of our deployment uh, scripts, upgrading those and uh, added um, more sort of monitoring um, with, uh, with Datadog so we can look at things uh, in real time. So as I mentioned in all the slides, in addition to doing new, new, <clears throat> um, building new services and features in the past year, uh, we spent a lot of time upgrading our services and the underlying infrastructure and code base and software, etc. So we are really um, placed very well for next year to do things more efficiently. So I'm really pleased with all the effort that we put in. Uh, to the um, to our um, services last year. Uh, one more slide. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, looking ahead, um, um, as everyone mentioned, we will be focusing more on the quality of the metadata. So as the engineering team, we will be looking at new services and features that could help you uh, with improving the quality of metadata. We will work with the community uh, to do this. And also uh, with the new um, community identifiers, uh, especially with Disco, they are looking into um, registering uh, large numbers of DOIs. So we will work on scalability and performance of our services to see how we can scale more cost efficiently uh, if, we are, if we're going to get a lot of DOIs in the coming years. So very exciting year ahead. And that is my update from engineering team. Just to remind everyone, we still have a lot of interesting uh, sessions to come. Um, uh, there's the data site roadmap led by Maria and Cordy right after this. And then we have the Harvester Roundtable. And later on in the day, you can hear more about uh, the Make Data Count initiative and um, uh, about metadata and also open infrastructure. So I will leave, leave it there. The link is down uh, on the slide. Uh, please uh, do go and register for these sessions to learn more. Uh, thank you. I think we have about six minutes for questions. Shall I hand this over to you, uh, Rory?
Uh, so actually, we have no time left uh, for for questions. However, I think the questions have that have all been asked have been answered in the uh, in the Q and A. Uh, so I leave it to Matt maybe to say some final words to close. Thanks, Rory. And um, yes, I do see that there was one question that came through. Um, and um, we'll follow up. We'll send some links and some details around that. Maybe, Helena, you could type about how to register RAIDs. Um, there is some documentation that we're working on with RAID. We'll provide that link and also share it as part of the uh, presentation and, and links I got following this presentation. Um, but with that, I just wanted to thank you all for joining. Um, we do want to uh, gather more feedback, so please do reach out. Um, it would be great to schedule any direct conversations or follow-up conversations with anyone in the community. And thank you again for your continued support, uh, and we look forward to working with you into the new year.